you were saying that using artificial intelligence has increased your speed in which you've been able to work on projects and get things out. Do you feel like, you know, you're saying time is money. Do you feel like you've actually made more money as a freelancer in utilizing AI tools versus what you were making before? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have to spend as much time on tedious work on, on really time consuming tasks that need my whole effort to put into because that's the first step into making the project and if that goes really smoothly and fast then the rest of the project is way easier to go ahead about so yeah ai is being used for scripting for shooting and producing movies ai is being used for everything for everything. hollywood production is being transformed by artificial, artificial intelligence, intelligence. intelligence. How can you use AI as a graphic designer? And when is it a good time to quit your day job to pursue a freelancing career? Well, it might be the pandemic. That question will be answered for you today in this episode of the Curious Refuge podcast. Our guest today is Julie Whelan. Julie is a multidisciplinary graphic designer and visual artist who has made a significant name for herself in the world of generative AI. Her work has been written about in major publications, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. That's amazing, Julie. Uh, Julie gives back to the creative world through helpful resources on her website, juliewheelan.com. We'll link to that below this video. And she has a very active social media presence where she shares AI generative art and tips and tricks that you can utilize in your day-to-day -day workflows. She can, of course, be found on most major social media platforms. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast, Julie. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I thought it'd be helpful just to kick things off by hearing a little bit about your background and what led you to where you are today. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Julie. <laughs> I am a graphic designer mm -hmm. turned, or not turned, but I've always, I guess, kind of been visual artist, but yeah, never really lived through it. Yeah, and yeah. now with AI being around, I dabbled a bit more into that area of my life again. So yeah, it's been a fun ride so far. And I mean, yeah, next to being a graphic designer, there's like coming a ton with it. Um, but it's pretty exciting how AI kind of changed everything, to be honest, like um, everything and nothing, but so much nevertheless. So yeah. I think it's really interesting that you have that background as a graphic designer, but you were embracing AI pretty early. Super early, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing. Like I was going through your Twitter, you've you have like fifty seven hundred posts, and most of them at this point are about AI. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> That's amazing. What got you kickstarted into learning about AI and using the tools? Working with the agency I work really close with, Neon um, in Luxembourg, they were very up to speed with the whole AI thing. And they were like, oh, have you seen Dali 2? Like, that's going to be crazy. And then get on the wait list. And I was like, I guess I could do that. Like, <laughs> let's go. And yeah, I think it was August 22 when I was off the, the waiting list on Dali 2. And from there, it was like, holy moly this is this is crazy like just like i i still feel like when people see the generations it's not like okay cool but when you actually prompt it it's just like how how does that work do you uh, remember the first thing you prompted using dolly it was probably something stupid like dark in in space or something like a pretty pretty sure it was that because they had like little tiles of, hey, try this prompt. And I, I think it was a dog in space. So oh, we did a dog as well. I remember it was like October in Rochester and we're like prompting Renaissance paintings of chihuahuas. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it just makes sense. <laughs> it's just adorable in any shape or form, you know, great. <laughs> well, I was reading on your website, Julie, you were saying that you you really kind of begun a lot of your formidable years when it comes to creativity on MySpace and DeviantArt, messing around with templates, which I'm sure it's really close to home for Shelby because she definitely uh, 
did a lot of uh, MySpace page customizations. I, I'm curious if you could speak to how those tools impacted you early on and if you think that they kind of helped to get you inspired to learn about the intersection of technology and art. So it, it, it definitely sparked something because I made it into my career, right? Like <laughs> there was something there. Like with, with MySpace, like I still miss it every day. I know it's technically still there, but not really, it's not the same anymore. It was just like the getting to be creative on yourself. Like you had those little templates and you could change your background and add your music. And I was just like, hell yeah, this is me. Like I'm 14, but this is me for the rest of my life. And yeah, just getting into that HTML, CSS, just to tweak it a little bit more, make it even more me, just like more emo, I guess. Um, yeah, that, that was just like, pretty cool and and I mean I did go to art school um in Luxembourg but yeah still it, w it was a lot of on paper stuff which was cool and then doing lots with your hands but ultimately like on the computer was where I felt very I don't know at home which I don't know if that's very healthy but I guess <laughs> we're here now um but yeah it, it was just cool to to kind of express whatever I wanted to express back then because I love taking photos but then you had the photo and you were like well this is boring I guess so yeah we all started with the correct version of Photoshop back then so that's also uh, how I got there and yeah just like learning all about it and and seeing other people I don't think YouTube tutorials were around that much like it really was like random people blogs tumblr maybe even and definitely deviant art so yeah just seeing inspiration there and and just trying it out yourself and i'm still like you you always have to learn yourself you can't rely on on school university whatever like you have to just do it yourself <laughs> and that's what i did back then and i kind of just Yes, I was still at that point. Like, and now it has become like that much more interesting again. Like, you 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 have that new kind of tech, and yeah, it it just like for me, it it constantly feels like I've come full circle. Like, I can now do again my little photos and take them to Photoshop, do a little more editing, and yeah. MySpace in, in DeviantArt created this place to kind of play and explore, and it feels like these maybe these AI tools are doing that same thing giving you this opportunity to kind of go back to that like yeah it's full circle <laughs> yeah I can totally see that I didn't have a a version of Photoshop during that season but I used Picasso a lot did you use Picasso oh yeah 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 that was my favorite tool <laughs> but I would like message people on MySpace and ask if I can edit their profile photo for them I don't know if that was um a very good way to go about making friends um <laughs> but <laughs> can I edit your photo? It needs some help. Uh, <laughs> <that> would... <laughs> By the way. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, maybe we can uh, unearth all the, your old MySpace profiles and we can just share it with the community in the show notes for this episode. Do those exist? <laughs> oh my God, I deleted mine. I Like, I still regret it. <laughs> Same. I feel like I was like, you know, 20. And I'm like, this is embarrassing. I need to like get rid of this. Um, okay, but fun fact for everyone. Caleb was always a rebel. And so we grew up together and his MySpace, you know, we had the top eight and you organize your friends based on your favorite. This is a terrible way to go about friendships. Um, however, Caleb had the foresight to see that that was terrible. He had our best friends, like one of our friend's moms as his first friend on MySpace. And it was always like, what is he doing? Why is this person your number one on MySpace? <laughs> Which is Why so not? funny. <laughs> I mean, it's better than having Tom there, right? Like still. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I love how, you know, this is like a podcast about the future of technology, but now we're like sounding like old timers talking about the good old days of like MySpace templates. <laughs> but I feel like AI brings out the most nostalgic and most melancholic thing in me. I don't know why or how, but... I constantly feel like I go back in time with it instead of into the future. I don't know. It's 
Yeah, it's really a thing. <laughs> That's so true. I feel like it, it unlocks your ability to creatively do that project or like create that image that you always dreamed of, but never had the ability to, to pull off. So I, I feel like I've been doing all of those prompts, you know, whether it's some beautiful like art directed thing or just like what would like fire dinosaurs look like? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. You left college and had a career, have a career as a graphic designer. Can you walk us through kind of where you, uh, your career took you and then how you actually transitioned now to where you are a freelancer working with AI on uh, graphic design projects? Yeah, so I feel like I went a very traditional kind of way. Uh, <laughs> I went to art school, then I went to university for design. And there, like, in my intern semester, that was when I really realized, like, how important it is to actually work in the field you, you study, because I saw it with so many other people that have never... I don't know that they, of course, in, in in university, they dabbled around and did their stuff, the logos, whatever we wanted to, or we had to create. But after the internship, a lot of people actually were like, this is not for me. <laughs> this is not it. And it's basically right at the end of your <laughs> university year. So I guess that kind of sucks. But yeah, I always kind of knew what what I wanted. And I don't know if it's still at that level, but you kind of had to get your bachelor to make a career and be successful. And yeah, I, I mean, I did stay in, in Berlin and uh, worked in startups and absolutely loved it. And it was a great time, but now as like, I never wanted to be a freelancer and <laughs> here I am now, and I probably wouldn't want to trade it now anymore. Like it's really cool to have that network growing from all the people I learned or like recognition <laughs> to all those years working in startups and all those people were like different kind of creatives. They funded their own brands and everything. So that's cool to help. That's interesting to hear that you didn't want to be a freelancer. I feel like most people want to work towards, you know, designing and creating for themselves, building their own schedule you know what how did you then become a freelancer the pandemic <laughs> yeah so it, it was mainly due to the opportunities that came with being at home kind of like i i definitely wanted to try it even before everything kind of turned south but i didn't know if i really wanted it to like i was like going into um uh What's it actually called? Half time working, like not full time. Part time, but... yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm I'm just gonna see if if it works out. If I have enough people around me and and making still enough money to survive. And th it, it was a bit, I guess, lucky uh, due to the pandemic that it all worked out, and I was able to become a freelancer super quickly. And I've actually never been happier because I never realized how <laughs> how much social anxiety work actually gave me um it yeah. is kind of crazy how I really wasn't made to work in an office with other people for 50 to 60 hours a week and that has been kind of life-changing and gave me a whole different kind of energy boost to be completely transparent and honest <laughs> like that's um yeah, and and now I, I couldn't see myself going back, even though I never wanted it <laughs> to happen, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel like, I feel the same way. You know, we work for ourselves now and it, it's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like, I, I love this so much more. But at the same time, having the experience of working in-house, I think with other people helped to kickstart my career and understanding to where I could freelance a little better. So I feel like both of those things combined really helped to create what I hope is a bit more of a well-rounded professional. <laughs> yeah, I, I would never change it. Like all those years working with other people in an office mm -hmm. is like what shaped me and, and made me like, yeah, 
kind of eager to keep going also like I, I feel like if I would have been a freelancer straight out of university I would not make 100 euros a month because I would just be <laughs> lazy and procrastinating the whole day and now I really have that drive and I know what I'm working for basically so yeah <laughs> is there a type of person that you'd say would do better in that full-time capacity I mean I I like when I worked full time, like nine to nine to five or whatever, <laughs> nine to a bit more than five always, um, it was good, but I felt very drained versus now I work 24 seven and I don't feel drained. So I don't really get it, but I, on the other hand, it makes sense because yeah, I can yeah, still yeah. just like, if I yeah. don't want to do it at like one o'clock, then I will do it. I don't know at 9 p.m. at night <laughs> because I can. So, so. I love that. I'm definitely like a night owl and I feel like <laughs> I could just get the most done in the evenings and that's not how the world works. So <laughs> it's Yeah, it's I mean, yeah, that's that's the problem, right? Like it, it's hard to, especially in a creative job, to always function. And now I can function on my time. But, I mean, at least <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> There's still deadlines, I guess. But yeah, it, it's really yeah. cool to plan around yeah my own kind of time and invest as much time as I want and not somebody else <laughs> you mentioned like kind of having that social anxiety as well which I really relate to um, but then I see you, you are speaking at a lot of events how is how, that for you yeah. like how are you yeah. overcoming that to to be on stage and to speak or to have conversations on a podcast like oh but that's completely different I'm not really like an in-person kind of person <laughs> like on podcasts and everything I'm still like in my little bubble here like <laughs> I'm at home so I don't feel like as as nervous as social anxious I don't know like I used to do like a theater and and, and <laughs> I was like a bit geeky theater and musicals and everything and I always like that was fine because I was playing a role <laughs> and now like if I have to be somewhere else I have to be like myself and that's really hard and I don't know like when I'm in the comfort of my own home it's a bit easier and I'm very relaxed like this is fine like I can do podcasts <laughs> and everything but life events is like really hard for me and if if I don't have to do it <laughs> I won't do it <laughs> But you have been doing it, right? And so I'm so curious at these live events recently, especially as you chat about artificial intelligence and how it's changing graphic design, photography, everything. What are some of those kind of main points that you share in those presentations? Like, what do you try to get across to the audience? To try it. <laughs> Even like a lot of people don't not try because they hate AI per se, but they are afraid of it. And that's something that I never really understand because you can't be afraid of something if you haven't tried it out. And people are always like, oh, but I'm going to lose my job because of AI. And I'm like, no, you can enhance your job because of AI. Like, of course, you don't have to use it, but at least try it out once, see if you understand it. And, and if not, that's fine. Like, you don't have to make it part of your job. Like, I never got into the whole... 3d stuff as much as i wanted to like it just didn't happen because like on one side i was too lazy on the other hand i was just like my brain doesn't function in 3d apparently and that's fine but i tried it out and i sometimes liked it but i never really wanted to have it in like as a part of my job and i try to always kind of show people what's possible with it and not to be yeah, just like too afraid of it. I don't know. It, it's it's always kind of weird to hear people be like, yeah, I'm, I'm terrified of AI. But then I'm like, why? <laughs> just try it out and, and see like, yeah, it's that's the main thing. But I also am very, I don't try to push it on people. Like I just mainly want to show what's possible and I mean, it's still very new and I live in my bubble and I always constantly feel like we all know about AI, right? And then I'm just talking with other graphic designers and they're like, I never heard of Midnight. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> it's Midjourney and yeah, okay, well, 
I guess we start here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's so funny. Yeah, I was reading a report recently and it was saying that a very low percentage of people use ChatGPT in their weekly work. And I was so surprised by that because it has so many practical applications for our team. I can't imagine not using <laughs> those tools uh, in a day-to-day -day capacity, but I, I think people are just slower to adopt uh, than, <laughs> than people like us that were going in and customizing our MySpaces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I want to get into some of the nuts and bolts and kind of the weeds here, because I think that you have a lot of technical understanding. And I love the fact that you've worked with a lot of clients. So you understand how to contextualize all these AI tools uh, for many different projects. Uh, so I really want to start things off, especially from this graphic design lens and ask you what types of projects, in your opinion, is really helpful for utilizing artificial intelligence at this point? Um, for everything mood boarding and really time consuming. Like for example, the amount of mood boards I created already has been insane and how much time that takes to just browse images on Pinterest, Google, wherever is like so time consuming and clients don't want to pay for that. Like they don't want to pay you basically just looking up beautiful pictures um it's just something that they don't acknowledge in a sense of how important it actually is to get a vision for your project and i basically reduced from like two or three days of image researches i now reduced it down to maybe maybe half a day because like as creatives we know what we want and we have the vision but it's just always super tricky to to find those <laughs> and to get like exactly what the client wants. And there's still so much Photoshop still involved because like you want, I don't know, a chihuahua wearing a suit, but you can only find dachshunds <laughs> wearing suits. And you're like, oh, damn, now I have to change that stupid hat from a dachshund to a chihuahua. And that's just like opening a door to save time and make more money and it's not even using ai in the end result like, like you don't have to use ai in your end project but to brief one your client but also later on your photographers your cinematographers like all those people to have like a yeah such a reduce reducing of time is like crucial especially as a freelancer like time is money and that's like the main bonus I can see always. Like there's, I guess, a few or a lot <laughs> of other things, but that's like my main, uh, yeah, the main graphic design aspect. <laughs> what would you say AI is currently bad at doing or assisting with? Actual logos and art direction. Like AI is kind of the intern. Like I'm the art director, but AI is only like the intern. I can push AI that much, but it doesn't come up with it itself. And that's totally fine. And it shouldn't. <laughs> like definitely ChatGPT does help spark some ideas, but in the end, like I still gave it that first spark. And then it's just like a conversation between two. Yeah, I don't know. An art director and an intern kind of. Well, and I think it's really important to note that you, you're a very talented art director. Your work is very good. And you spent many years developing that creative taste and that understanding, that ability to communicate as an art director with other collaborators. And I, I'm curious to you, do you feel like those skills helped you to become better at prompting and utilizing AI tools? Probably, yeah. I would say so, yeah. I like writing creative briefs is like basically what a prompt is. Like I always tell people, treat it like a creative brief because like you have to know who are you shooting, what's the emotion you wanna grab, like what's your subject, what's the scene, what's the lighting like, like what camera do we need, what are the settings? Like that's exactly what comes into the prompt. And I think it, it helped both ways. Like now I can kind of better 
tell people what I want in words because I have to use words more now than actual visuals and the other way around like having that visual knowledge and yeah that the creative past is like what shapes the prompts <laughs> so yeah it's a give and take <laughs> and you were saying that using artificial intelligence has increased your speed in which you've been able to work on projects and get things out do you feel like you know you're saying time is money do you feel like you've actually made more money as a freelancer in utilizing ai tools versus what you were making before i would say so yeah but also my niche did change a little bit so it's hard to say if it's just because of it but it definitely yeah i mean i i don't have to spend as much time on tedious work on on really time consuming tasks that need my whole effort to put into because that's the first step into making the project and if that goes really smoothly and fast then the rest of the project is way easier to go ahead about so yeah has it been challenging to figure out what to quote folks for these projects like say you have a client um, do you kind of figure the project pricing based on like graphic design projects or are you kind of creating a new framework around pricing for AI projects? I'm still figuring it out. It's super hard um, because, I mean, people are saving time there for money themselves, but I also can't reduce my own money like t too much to them. Um, but I don't want to quote as much as a photographer if I do generate images. But also, on the other hand, they got it within a day instead of having a whole team having to go there, shoot it, and get it retouched. And that would take two weeks versus I do it in a day. So I always try to find a good balance, but it's super hard. And I still don't have it figured out 100%. Like... We'll see. It's super tricky to to um, find a good balance there. So if you have any, <laughs> any tips on it, I'll gladly take you. Well, we've talked about this on the podcast before, but you know, generally speaking, whenever you look at Hollywood, for example, and you take a look at different artists, the more technical the artists, the more money they typically make, right? So you know, an entry level VFX artist doesn't make as much as like an experienced compositor who doesn't make as much as a VFX supervisor and or a technical director, right? Uh, and so I think it's interesting because I feel like you have a lot of technical skills that are highly valuable in this moment right now. You know, because I was watching a breakdown that you were giving earlier, and it was like okay, I'm going into mid-journey and prompting for this, and then I'm taking that, up it, sending it over to Magnific, then I'm going into Photoshop, outpainting, and sending it to Lightroom to do depth of field adjustments. And it's, it's a, that's an awesome technical workflow. I don't think the average graphic designer is, has utilized each one of those tools in that sequence and, and can understand how that plays into the larger like storytelling context of like a, an advertising campaign. So it seems like the skills that you're bringing to the table are those like highly technical skills combined with your really awesome taste that that is financially valuable. It's not just creatively valuable. It is like very much financially valuable for, for agencies who are looking to have quick turnaround times. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, we live in a very ASAP like society and, and as much as people always drag it that now with AI, everything is like, kind of fast foodie it just is what it is like I, I wish I could spend three weeks on searching the perfect image and getting it created by a photographer by whoever um but that's just not reality and maybe it is for some and my god that's amazing but it's not for me yeah it's so funny we were giving a talk recently talking about creative mediums and how they've evolved over time. And, you know, when photography came out, people were so upset because, you know, it takes away from the the nuanced, you know, painting, you know, a, a realistic scenescape. And, uh, you know, people were upset about what that was going to do to society because it was going to cheapen, you know, expression and creative experience and stuff like that. 
and you know, it's funny because in one sense, obviously, you know, photography is a beautiful art form and we're able to see all, you know, incredible expressions of, of creativity, like through this medium. And in another sense, it's like, well, yeah, like, I guess we did kind of progress as a society and we do kind of move on a little faster and yet creativity is still pushed forward and stories are still told. And so it's like, even, you know, whenever we start catastrophizing about like, oh, this is just going to put out more artwork and more creativity and it's going to make things faster or whatever. It's like, yeah, it totally could. But then it, creative humans are going to take that and put project meaning into it. And it's, it's not a bad thing. It's just a new evolution in our creative expression, which I think is totally cool. <laughs> yeah. And, and nothing went away, right? Like, analog photography is still here and and it's now even more expensive and it's even more like a a real skill you have to learn and and i mean we all have a phone with a camera now <laughs> like we are all kind of we could all be technically photographers but still you have to have that special something to make it like really creative and it, that will never be taken away, not by AI, not by whatever comes next. Like it's, it's always gonna stay, and it's just gonna it. It will make so many mediums more, yeah, appreciated and more valuable. So yeah, your taste and your discernment as an art director really push these projects to becoming what they are. And so this is such an important skill. You can't just prompt. <laughs> you know, it's. it's Taste is everything. I try to really push it all the time. Like I'm always trying to get my my all those little visuals in my head to really into I don't know into those prompts. I want to hop into a bit of your design workflow uh, and talk about what that looks like. But first, we noticed on your Twitter account you talk a lot about this tool called uh, Let's AI, uh, and so we've never messed around with this tool much. I don't know if you have Caleb. Um, but uh, you say you use Midjourney, Pika, Runway, and then Let's. So what is Let's AI? So that's from the agency I work really close with from Luxembourg. And they basically did their own version of Midjourney-ish. <laughs> and yeah, it's just super fun to, to work with, with the guys on, on that kind of tool and, and to see even more of the technical side of it. Because now, I mean... I'm not part of it, but I love seeing them geek about it and, and really push it to the absolute limits. But um, yeah, it's super useful and, and actually uh, having a few updates real soon, which I probably won't talk about too much. But um, yeah, it, it's yeah, it's um, it's very cool because I am from Luxembourg. It's such a teeny tiny country and I'm always like super proud if there's something yeah coming out of it and then seeing it sprout and grow and yeah <laughs> always makes me very proud so you said the guys how many people are on that team that's developing a mid-journey like competitor i think around five six ish i'm probably forgetting someone but yeah i, I think around like that's around it yeah that's pretty wild though that you can create <laughs> like a, a competitor in an amazing cutting edge space with five to six people. <laughs> like, that's amazing. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, yeah, it's absolutely crazy to see how, how much, I mean, it again, takes so much time to get it going, but to see what it will be able to do is absolutely fascinating and cool to see. So, yeah. <laughs> so, Let's get nerdy with it. I would love to hear about your workflow. So you're working on a graphic design project. You need some assets. What is your technical workflow right now? Right now, it basically, like, I don't even write down my ideas anymore. <laughs> I just go to prompting. Um, but yeah, I, I use Midjourney mainly for everything visual. Um, but... Whereas I, I like with version four or five or more like four, I was very like, okay, this is just like maybe a little bit of a scribble and I'll take it to Photoshop. And then version five came around and it got tons better. But 
I still try to maintain it. Like I never accept the raw prompt and I always take it from mid journey to Photoshop or Lightroom, mostly both. And now I even added a tool more, which is Magnific. And yeah, I, I mean, that's kind of basically the workflows. Like I have a project and whatever it is and what visuals will be needed. I go into my journey and then add my own little touch to it. Like there is never anything really raw out there and trying to keep it that way. Like I, I still have sometimes a bit of an issue with raw output generations and, and just being like, this is not 100% me. <laughs> like I need to have at least one little thing added that, that is like, well, I was, I was a collaborator in this, like actually, um, but maybe that's just me. I don't know. Um, but yeah. And then it depends on, on the work that is needed, but usually after that, taking it to InDesign, to Figma, totally depending on, on that one. But yeah. When you don't have a project with, you know, a brief and you're just wanting to explore and learn these tools for yourself as an artist to maybe improve your workflow, your craft, where do you begin with a project? Do you have something in mind? Where do you find inspiration to start creating for fun? Oh, that's a good question. Like sometimes just life, just going outside and I saw some people doing something and we're like, that was funny. <laughs> like, I'm just going to go into a little mid journey and do a little coffee shop scene and having that build a story. Like, I don't know. I, I never had that tool to visualize my stories. I don't know. Like storytelling was always kind of love doing it, but they were just in my head and <laughs> they also died in there, I guess, because like there was no outlet for them. And now I can just go ahead and, and t try and tell that story. Like I, that's kind of what I do on Twitter. I, there's no real meaning behind anything and, and just like having fun with it. It's like documenting life as it's happening. I love that. That's really beautiful. Yeah. But also, yeah, sometimes inspired by a book or an article I'm reading or it's like a movie I've watched. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> wanting to end it differently like the, this scene was stupid like yeah, I want to do it differently um yeah that's basically kind of it and yeah we'll see life and I mean sometimes there's a spark on on Pinterest when I see a beautiful picture I'm like whoa <laughs> this is amazing like I'm gonna see if I can recreate it with just the words like I never use the images in my prompt but trying to achieve that kind of aesthetic and yeah I mean that's that's how I learn how to use it then later in projects right like otherwise if if I don't train my prompt structures and knowledge like all the time I don't know it gets kind of rusty and then I don't know where to start versus now I I tried so much in my journey that I kind of know where to start when a more specific thing is needed how are you enjoying Mid Journey 6? Do you feel like it's changed any workflows or the way you prompt in any way? I hated it in the beginning. Or not hated, but I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like, I, I, I had such a good flow and now everything kind of changed because they did change it to a bit more of a natural language. And also the visuals were very different. Like they were way more saturated a lot more contrast was in it and my stuff usually was very matte and yeah a, a bit more soft and it was really hard to get back to that point and I don't know if they did a few updates already and just don't announce it but now it's getting a bit easier again but I also had to tweak my prompts sometimes a lot sometimes a little I saw your comparison on Twitter and a few or X, but a few folks were saying they liked the the five version better. It was this like uh woman, the the pink 
glow around her. I think version five was very cinematic versus version six now is a bit more, yeah, a bit, a bit more harsh. Like it's still like, it's cool for some visuals, but sometimes I go back to five because I need that a certain aesthetic that I kind of established for myself. And it's just really hard to, to get to that point. And it's always easier in Photoshop, for example, to add contrast than to take it away. So that's kind of where I'm like, oh God, I just need that raw image kind of texture to it to then better edit it. But yeah, I, I totally understand how they went about it because most people probably don't take it to, I don't know, Photoshop or wherever to edit it. So it's yeah, <laughs> I feel the same way. I think most of the time when I'm prompting with BitJourney now, I, I was using six at first and then I just go to 5.2 now and uh, utilize it because it's what I know. And six, I like last night, I was working on some website mockups and could not get version six to create decent website <laughs> mockups, but version five, it was just every prompt was like really interesting. So I don't know why that's the case. I don't know if the training data set was just much smaller uh, with six, but it's it's interesting. <laughs> kind of the beauty of mid journey, right? It, like you can always go back to the versions, which thank God, because there's so many tools out there that just push the updates. And I'm like, no, wait, I finally understood how it works. And I got like a good workflow with it. And then it completely changes and you can't go back. And that's like super annoying. So. I'm happy that they still have all versions in there. <laughs> really nice. I think they really balance the like, you have a lot of customizable controls in mid journey, but not too many. I've started using some of these tools, especially the ones that will be basically just UIs that allow you to unlock stable diffusion, but just like from the cloud. And there are so many parameters to edit and to adjust and to change that most of your time is not spent in the creative flow state, talking with the tool, typing in a prompt, seeing like adjusting your creative direction. It's spent adjusting little sliders, you know, with seed iteration numbers and, and just like all of these things that are fine. Like it's great to have that customization, but ultimately kind of get in the way of the creative process. So I, I feel like mid journey is like that perfect uh, balance. Absolutely, 100%. And also people are super annoyed about it having been in Discord for that long, but Honestly, it's the perfect entry level. Like you can have it anywhere you go. Like the amount of times I just sit in the subway and then generate some stuff because like I can basically take my work with me now. <laughs> like that's such a cool thing to have. And with a website, sure it works, but it's never really the same. And and Discord, it's I don't know, I understand it. Like it's 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 low. Yeah, low maintenance. Like I'm, I'm not getting distracted by it. Versus on a website, I, if it's loading, I just go to a different website and then I'm shopping. And I'm like, I was doing something else, and then yeah. So Julie, you yeah. are a graphic designer, Graphs. which is typically you static, non-moving design, right? But what? with these AI tools, you've had the opportunity to add motion mm -hmm. to your work. What does that look like kind of moving from being a designer to maybe a motion designer? Do you have motion design experience in your past? And what tools do you use uh, in your work to give your projects movement? So I had no animation, motion design knowledge at all. Like if anything, I'm very Tumblr. Like I put three images below each other, put some little <laughs> subtitles on there and that's enough movement for me, right? Like that's that, that's how I tell the story. But with, I think the first one was Runway that I tried out. Like beside my little Twitter for image kind of storytelling, I was now able to animate those images I generated. And like that has never been on my bingo card to ever go into like editing tools uh, for video. And I actually even upgraded from a MacBook to like a Mac mini because my MacBook was basically burning at that point. And I was like so eager to work further from like with all the runway outputs and later also Pika to actually be able to form a little short film or 
I don't know, just like some short little whatever <laughs> with AI. Um, so yeah, like last summer was the first time I opened Premiere Pro and now it's basically, <laughs> it has become one of my weekly tools, which is pretty cool. And it, again, like that was kind of reverse. Now I kind of know how to work with motion and not just like the 2D side of it, which is amazing. And yeah, I don't know. It's just so much fun to see those <laughs> Those little words that I prompted form into an image and then form a video and, and just move and tell a story. Like, I don't know, that's just so wow. fascinating to me. And it's really like video even takes it to a whole different level. And at one point we will reach like a mid journey kind of quality and we will be mind blown. <laughs> Yeah, I think that it's going to be here maybe in the next 12 months or so that, you know, photorealistic quality via video. It's really interesting because Shelby and I we used to work for a motion design school and it was really cool to be involved in the process of people kind of going from graphic designer, like what your your background is in, to becoming a motion designer. But what was what was really interesting is when you started getting into those tools, After Effects, Cinema 4D, you know, these like tools that motion designers use on a day-to-day -day basis, you realize that they're pretty dang technical. And if you want to really unlock them, you have to like start learning coding languages that are like pretty technical and you have to buy a bunch of plugins, which is, it, it's fine. It's just part of the process, but it does take a significant amount of time. And so you kind of are limited in your creative expression because of just the fact that like it kind of has to be your career to be an After Effects artist, but to, or to be a Cinema 4D artist. And so I, I think it's really cool to think about how what's happening now is we don't have to get relegated to one specific part of the creative pipeline. If you literally have a vision for some cool 3D animated branding campaign, like you you can begin to do that right now, and then within 12 months, you 100% will be able to do something that's network quality. <laughs> it's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Mind blowing. Yeah. It's, it's so fascinating. <laughs> I would love to hear from you. Okay. Cause one of the things I think I see folks struggle with and I struggle with in projects is like the consistency with AI. So characters, I want to hear about like when you're working with a brand, how are you getting their colors into these images? Are you how are you working with their logos? How are you creating that brand consistency using AI tools? Yeah. So I, I always do tell them that we'll see how it goes. Like there's no, there's no promise that it will work, but given that I mostly did all that before working with AI, like I know how I get my work around. Like if the colors are not like, perfect matching the aesthetic of the brand i know how to tweak it in photoshop or wherever it's needed so that's a bonus on having that kind of knowledge next to just using the raw outputs for example from mid journey um but yeah character consistency is still very hard especially in mid journey like there's definitely other tools that have been super good with it like if, if you know a little bit of Stable Diffusion or tools that use Stable Diffusion, it's doable. However, the quality then again is like maybe not as aesthetic as Midjourney. So I did try to find a few workarounds in Midjourney and I even did a little tutorial about it. But yeah, it's, it's, far, from, it's far from perfect and still very, very limited. And so, yeah, I, I always try to avoid <laughs> that kind of having to go with really like strict character consistency. And, and if that's like not, yeah. Will you prompt Sorry. to the best you can for the aesthetic of the image to get close to the brand and then use Magnific to, to um, up-res it and then take it into Photoshop and kind of make adjustments with the colors and layer on textures as needed? to match the brand aesthetic. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, it's basically like, usually if you do have like a, a brand that's mainly on social media and, and having like a very 
strict kind of aesthetic working for them. It's usually due to some presets and color corrections. Like it's never just that. So yeah, it, it's basically the same kind of workflow if, if it would be photography or at that point, like image generations. So yeah. That's great. I, I really want to get very tactical and specific with some of the insights that I think you can bring to the table, Julie, because of your background with photo editing, graphic design, all of these things. So we talk about Midjourney. I think a lot of people that listen to this podcast use Midjourney every single day. They're, they're on the subway prompting exactly like what you talked about. And so I, I would love to get some Midjourney tips here in a little bit, but specifically you also talked about using uh, you know, Photoshop for basically everything and then utilizing Lightroom a little bit. So I'm curious if you could be um, just kind of like a mentor real quick for those who are listening to this podcast, what are some of the things that you do inside of Photoshop and Lightroom on a regular basis as it relates to editing your AI images? And then if, you know, Photoshop can be overwhelming, there's so many buttons, so many things you can learn, right? What are some of the specific tools or plugins or filters that you use on most of your projects that you think people should really hone in on and, and get good at using in order to elevate their AI projects? So the easiest probably to start with is really Lightroom. And on mobile, I think it's even for free. It should be able for free. So it's really like a, an amazing entry point to take your generations and I don't know, just run like a preset over it. Like you can buy them, but you don't have to. There's like a, a good amount of presets already built in there that help take those raw outputs to the next level. And then just going in there, change a little bit of the lighting, the contrast, and really see how when you change those specific colors, how it changes the image and the whole story. like. Colors have emotions, and sometimes Midjourney doesn't really catch that specific emotion that you actually want to, yeah, transmit. And and then taking it to Lightroom is like the next step to actually tell that story. And it's basically the same that I do with Photoshop. It's a, for me, <laughs> for me, it's a tad easier because I just do like four little artboards next to each other, and then taking the images in there. And then I just go in there with selective color correction. And then I see like in the overview, how much I have to tweak for each image to make it one coherent story. But yeah, that's kind of a bit more <laughs> next level. Uh, Lightroom is perfect to, to start with, but yeah, taking it really to Photoshop and adding grain, adding, yeah, there's like selective color and, and light contrast again it it really makes such a huge difference and just <laughs> photoshopping those little artifacts that sometimes Midjourney just has and the, those weird little gibberish words that are everywhere I just I kick them off sometimes because it's just so annoying because the picture is so good and then there's like Bleh, in there and I go why but yeah that is so good. I love the tip of having your artboard set up with all of your images and then using individual color correction in that larger context rather than editing them one at a time. I think that's a really wise uh, workflow that most people don't think about. Are there any specific Lightroom presets maybe beyond just the built-in ones that you like to use in your projects? I do, but I also just like did a lot of them myself that I just saved because I do tend to go like more green and red kind of contrasty. So I did a lot of them just myself and added a ton of green because it's just what I love doing. <laughs> they never have enough green. Um, but yeah, like the, the buildings are pretty good. Like I use those a lot of times too. Um, there's no super specific ones I use all the time. I always try to adapt it to the image, but yeah, also doing a lot of them. 
Is there an AI tool you use to add grain or do you just add grain? Uh, it's always Photoshop. Like I have a ton of grain overlays from Creative Market <laughs> that I use all the time. And they just give that kind of, yeah, film effects, which are even better than just like adding noise and grain to it because it has like that little imperfections in there. But yeah, I, I didn't find any AI tools that could do it just yet. Like my journey has gotten better with grainy stuff, but not perfect yet. <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. It, it like, it does the color correction correct as if it was shot on analog cameras but it's it doesn't understand like how to properly have like the specs be this the right size and in the right spots yeah it's still always like too plasticky like that's what annoys me the most like it's always yeah too yeah just too plastic i need it to be flat <laughs> where do you get your grain i'm curious uh mostly on creative market i i bought like a ton of them <laughs> like an unhealthy amount of just <laughs> grain. And a library of grain. <laughs> yeah. Don't Funds and grain. <laughs> so much <Yeah>. grain. <laughs> love that. I have the same thing for video, like tons of just like film, you know, like looping film grains that I can just drag and drop. Uh, I have a friend actually, he opened a company called Film Composite and he went in and shot like really high res grains uh, that people, you know, use on various projects. We, we can link to that. They're really great. <laughs> he like did an amazing job. Well, so Julie, I'm really curious uh, because you also talked about using Magnific a bit, uh, especially recently, you know, it feels like they're like the only thing people are talking about over the last month, which is great. Uh, but, you know, you're saying, okay, mid-journey images tend to be kind of plastic, kind of warped. And then whenever I throw images from mid-journey into Magnific, they then become hyper sharpened and very kind of hyper real in almost a beyond editorial kind of way. And I'm curious about where Magnific for you, how does it fit into your workflow? Is it like the last step after you've done everything? Is it right after mid journey? Like, how are you thinking about up resers and it, are you using it on most of your projects or are you just up resing like from mid journey and then going into Photoshop? Oh, I use it religiously at the <laughs> moment. Like I really take almost all of my mid journey generations to Magnific right now. And I realized that the prompt is like super important for the output. Like I never not have a prompt and I usually go back to like, sometimes my prompts don't really make sense in terms of the output. And then I just go into mid journey again and do the describe function and let Midjourney re-describe basically the image I generated with it. Like it's a bit <laughs> chicken in the egg and then it's just rolling back again. Um, and having that very specific description of the image helps a lot. And really, if you want to have like specific details, for example, the teeth sometimes look a bit weird already in the raw output, and then they look just as weird in Magnific. But if you prompt like beautiful teeth, then the tool actually knows, oh, okay, actually it's teeth, and <laughs> not just some weird bricks on a face. Um, so that helps a lot. And also tweaking the, the settings. Like I tend to go with portraits in the negatives with the creative um, little slider. So yeah, just it, it takes a while to to really get around and not having it be like, yeah, as you said, like over sharpening and basically doing a different person with it. <laughs> like it's so much Photoshop in like a magazine that you're like, that's not the same person. In in light of all the steps you go through to complete your project, do you set parameters for yourself? Like, okay, Julie, we're going to edit this one more time and not obsess over it anymore and we're going to wrap it up. Because I think, I, I don't know, for me, I, I can just obsess over refining something so long that I never actually get it out there. Like, do you have rules for yourself and your creative process to wrap things up? Yeah, I used to be very, very perfectionist on everything. Like, there was never, I accept... 80% and 
the other trainee, I'll see if I need them. Now with AI, I tend to embrace it a bit more. I'm just kind of more, this is fine. <laughs> this is out of my control at this point. It gets the story out. I don't care anymore. Um, but that also depends again on the project. If it's just like for myself, uh, some, some just ideas I want to get out there, then I try to not perfectionist over it anymore as much as I used to. Um, but it depends on the day and <laughs> how much I'm in the mood to really go into the nitty gritty. Well, Julie, I know that we've been going a while here. I want to begin to wrap things up uh, with a few last questions. So like you were just talking about uh, just a minute ago, you know, AI is only going to get better from here. This is the worst version of AI that we're ever going to see. And it's beautiful photorealistic renders that like, look like they belong in our art gallery. So I'm curious, especially for you, because you have such an extensive background in graphic design, advertising, creativity in general, what should creative people do to help them think about their career over the next few years? Because it's obviously things are going to change. What are some of the skills that you think are going to be timeless and really important to just continue to grow in and uh, to progress? Maybe if you have resources for developing those skills and what skills do you think are very temporary? Uh, you know, for example, I don't, I don't know, maybe prompting in mid journey, maybe, you know, a few months from now, we're just going to be able to use nat natural language and it won't be something that we have to spend a lot of time developing. Yeah. I mean, I guess the last point we've already seen now, right? Like I, I obsessively built out like a prompt structure in like version four and five. And now it's like basically, it's not completely from zero, but very much so. Like using natural language now feels unnatural, which sounds stupid. But yeah, and I mean, I'm not a native English speaker. So for me, it's easier to just, write in like commas and then being very like choppy about it and now having to form actual phrases that make sense is like not always the easiest um so i think prompt engineering could could be temporary i'm not sure or maybe like all the text-based text to image text to video could be temporary like we'll see i don't know but you will never regret learning the traditional ways of doing stuff. Like I now got into the whole video editing tools because of AI. And even if AI is gone tomorrow, I can still now kind of edit a video if needed. <laughs> that is not AI related. So having that knowledge in how to get from A to B without AI necessarily being in there is like super important and, and will probably never go away. Like it's very niche now to use it with AI, like traditional with generative stuff, but traditional will never go away. And I don't, maybe, maybe it will, but I don't think that generative tools will ever stand like just alone. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's just me, but at least I, I don't see it for now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I, I think that generative content by itself is not as interesting, but when people are able to go in and edit, even if it's a small amount, you, you, you can usually feel it and then it's better. Um, okay, cool. Well, I have one last question that I know we'll uh, kick it over to, to Shelby who will finish this out. So I want to end here with maybe five quick tips like each tip could be like 10 to 15 seconds that you have learned or that you utilize in your day-to-day -day workflows that you think people would find very interesting it could be in mid-journey it could be in photoshop whatever tool you want uh what are five things that like you are just excited about and that you uh would love to share <laughs> okay wait <laughs> no pressure <laughs> so yeah um <laughs> So the first one in mid journey to really go the extra mile, usually like I'm not 
the biggest fan of using artists and everything in the prompt, but if you prompt painters, for example, to generate post photography, like photographic looking stuff, takes it to a whole new level. <laughs> it's always way more creative and has a lot more definite instead of using, I don't know, David LaChapelle or something. Like actually using photographers for photography stuff is usually less inspiring than using artists from a different medium. That's one very main thing I do a ton. And I think most people don't usually think about it that way because painting is painting, photography is photography, but they can mix really well and create a good kind of mix in there. I mean, in Photoshop, we kind of already said it, always add green. <laughs> yeah. Like on creative market, if you just like search there for like grainy stuff. And I, I guess there's even more like free stuff out there. Like people give a ton of resources, I guess there is a lot you can find. Um, yeah, the third one would be to really never accept a raw prompt. <laughs> I don't know. That's like really my golden rule. I. I know it's it's very biased because I do have that background as a graphic designer and that's just like my natural go my go to. But yeah, like there's a ton of tools out there like Lightroom on mobile, um Visco. Oh, what was the other one? There was like one very I don't remember. But yeah, there's a lot of editing tools out there to take the raw outputs to yeah just make it a bit more your own to take it to the next level and the same with video um i used to really just like edit my tiktok videos on on mobile i can never touch any video tools on my macbook until like a few months ago um there's like a spline cap cut those tools are amazing to to learn how to get into all of those uh, areas and then make it, yeah, take it from there, um, from runway Pika. Like there's always cool things, but only having those four seconds is kind of not enough to tell a story. And I mean, there's possibilities to, to edit basically everything on your phone by now. So it's doable to get a good in entry there. Now we'll shift one. That's hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, to just try it out and, and really go crazy. Like usually for me, the stuff I where I go completely nuts is the best results. And even using like emojis or stuff like that in, in mid journey gives you like the coolest results. It's so weird to just put emojis in there, but I don't know, it's like a little crystal ball and then the little stars and then it shapes like that beautiful little environment of a little alien city or like super whimsical and dreamy thingies. So I couldn't prompt it if I wanted to, but with those emojis, it really takes it to that sparkly little moment. <laughs> yeah, I really love that. <laughs> I want to try that immediately. That is so fun. I've never used emojis in my prompts, but I love that. Yeah, it's actually pretty cool. Like, it works so well. Well, I, I think that is going to transition us to our rapid fire questions. So we like to end things with just some quick questions, just off the top of your head, whatever the first thing to come to your mind is, feel free okay. to uh, answer away. <laughs> yep. And um, I have a few here, but We'll get started. And at the end, I would love to learn if there's anything else you'd like to share with our audience or just plug anything that you're working on. Um, yeah, that'd be great. But okay, rapid fire questions. What is your favorite and least favorite font? Oh, my favorite at, at the moment, they change a lot. At the moment, it's inter again. It's very basic, I know. And my... A current one I really don't like is Korean New. I don't know why. Like, I really like it, but I tried it, like, I think today, and I was like, ew, <laughs> this looks so weird. It's not even Comic Sans, but I was just like, ew, this looks so weird. Something know. just switches. Maybe it's like you're seeing it too much. It's like, I can't anymore. 
Kind of yeah. Like- that, that was something. I don't when you know. get obsessed with one food and you're like, I can't. I've, yeah, exactly. I've overdone it. Have to back away. <laughs> maybe you've read too many scripts. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Oh my God, I didn't think about it. That could really well be it. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, is there a playlist you go to or what music do you listen to when you're working on AI projects? Oh, I have one that is like very maybe very fitting to the thing I said before, very nostalgic. It's very like um, early 2000s and (laughs) it's like the weirdest playlist, but I love it absolutely. And it always brings me in a good mood. Um, But other than that, it's probably like Broadway stuff, like Wicked having that on in the background. It's (laughs) very, (laughs) yeah, the creative juice is flowing, yeah. We went to see Wicked last year in London for the first time, and it was amazing. So fun. It's so good. I, I can't wait for the movie to come out, like, end of year. I'm, <laughs> I'm geeking out about it. <laughs> <We're> good. <laughs> so you're building your top eight on MySpace, and they are AI tools. Who or what tools are in the top eight for you? Okay. Let's see if we can get eight together. So first one, definitely Mid Journey. Then we have Magnific, has to be in there. Let's AI, it's the third one. Then we have Runway, Pika. Stable Fusion has to be in there, even though it's like more of the cousin, right? Like, Like for family reasons, I have to put it in there. Like we don't talk about, <laughs> like we don't yeah. talk every day, but Hey, we have to get along. Has to be there. <laughs> yeah. Then Topaz, I would say it's probably, they have some AI in there. So also very distant family, I would say. <laughs> now it's like two relatives that just have to be in there for p- family reasons, for sort of piece of it. Um, I think there's still one missing, right? Oh, I mean, oh no, that's so bad. Firefly. Like Firefly. Adobe Firefly. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. probably should be more in the front, but hey, there's eight. <laughs> Love that. That's too fun. <laughs> Why was I hearing emo music playing while you were describing your MySpace top eight? <laughs> <laughs> it was just like Billy Talent blasting in the background. <laughs> Red flag. <laughs> were you yeah. also the person? I was like, okay, I'm going to put the emo song that's cool in the moment, but I'm not going to make their most popular one. I'm going to do like the third part. You know, you like kind of yeah. gotta curate. Just curate. because I'm different, <laughs> I'm cool. <laughs> yeah, because I know their music. You know, uh, yeah. But that. also very indie stuff that nobody knew. Like that also was like very, very MySpace, very emo. <laughs> we love it. It's so fun. Uh, who is the ideal brand you would love to partner with? Oh my god, that's always so hard. I don't know. I always kind of say Starbucks. Okay. I would love to just work with them maybe once. But I, 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 I'm I, also kind of terrified that I would regret it. You know, it's like Ooh. never meet your heroes. Yeah, uh-huh. that's such a good point. <laughs> I know. You're like, I want it to just go so well, but it's like work. So sometimes it is hard and right. But I love this idea of you prompting for like these scenes you see at coffee shops of like people having coffee or like maybe a cute dog and i could totally see that being like an eventual partnership with them yeah that would be really i would love to do like a little commercial mood kind of thingy like i don't even know if they do that really like they obviously have their little advertising shots but like a real mood shot for like starbucks that would be cool that would be really cool and what is your starbucks order Oh, a soy vanilla latte. Yeah, that's awesome. Very basic. <laughs> I feel like I've been into, I love cappuccinos, but um, they're always like way too much milk at Starbucks. So I've learned to get the like, do you know the kid size? You can get like, oh yeah. I think it's like a short or something. So great. It's the right amount of milk. It's just like this tall. It's like, great. That's actually a good tip. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. 
<laughs> yeah. Next time, just like that might be the most know. helpful tip on the whole podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Stay <laughs> until the end. <laughs> exactly. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. This has been so fun. I am excited to just keep in touch with you to follow your journey. I'm so inspired by you. You're just an incredible artist, and you. I. I like immediately. I'm going to go prompt with emojis just to see what I get. And they use my like. What if I use my top five emojis on my keyboard? Let's just see what happens. Um, <laughs> Excited to see it. <laughs> I, I'll share with you immediately. Uh, so is there anything else you'd like to share or plug with our audience? I don't think so. Just like people need to have fun with prompting. I don't know. Just don't take it too seriously, but know that we're like very, very early on. Like it's very niche. We live in a little bubble and it will come and, and it's just like the internet it it's here to stay and it's not going away anytime soon and the sooner you really get behind it and try to understand it because it's hard to really understand it but already having like one foot in the door is better than not trying it out at all and then in five years being completely lost like I, I see it with so many colleagues of mine that I'm just like, I'm not going to push it on you, but if I were you, I would at least somewhat try it out and then see if it's applicable for some stuff. And yeah, I think that's just it. <laughs> yeah. And if someone wants to follow you online, where what are the channels they should go to? Um, so mostly... Twitter or X um, at Julie W Design, and that's also the same on Instagram. And yeah, I think those are the two main <laughs> social media channels where I post the most about AI and with AI. So yeah, there. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you being on the podcast. We'll be sure to link to everything that Julie talked about below this video. And uh, would love to circle back, you know, maybe a, a year from now and hear how your workflow has changed and uh, how your top eight has changed. That would be so interesting because one year ago, life was different. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of stuff changed. So let's do it. <laughs>